All right, actually, um, let me just say that um, I really enjoyed the first presentation and uh, it gave me a lot to think about. And it's, uh, it's sunny here over on Bowen Island this afternoon. And I hope you're all still feeling creative and that um, you did some of those exercises if they were safe for you to do and you were listening to the instructions and you were hearing some background music. So what I am going to do is kind of carry on this theme of creativity and art and look at some uh, auditory ways in which you can be creative too. And I'm going to try to focus on also what we lose as we get older, but also how we can preserve um, and age well, whether or not we have sensory loss. So I am going to tell you some some. Uh, kind of boring details you probably already know about how our eyes and ears and balance systems and um, you know all of our senses actually change with age but I'll focus on on hearing but bring home that everything is connected and that all of this is connected to the rest of our health and also to our brain and how we basically use our senses as the gateway to the world as we go about our everyday activities and then kind of like you know, another version of the same story you heard in the first uh, section about, well, what kind of sensory activities can you do to keep your brain healthy? And I'm not, I'm gonna kind of go the gamut from 40 to 120. I don't really uh, see that uh, this would not be relevant to anybody who is interested in any phase of aging, whether you'd like to prevent dementia, or whether you'd like to live well with it. So we're gonna do the whole gamut. And uh, if we can just can I actually skip to the next slide. There we go, okay. So let's just get some details about sensory loss. And I'm sure this is not gonna be a surprise to you that your hearing and your vision, when you get older, they're not like the same way they were when you were 20. What you might not realize is that these are very, very common problems. So actually hearing loss and vision loss in uh, studies on the global burden of disease, so looking at all the diseases you could possibly have, these are the second and third most common impairments. So um, we are all uh, confronted by these changes, some with more severe changes than others. Go to the next slide. All right, so I would also like to share with you that the Canadian Institutes for Health Research has some fabulous uh, national projects which involve hundreds of researchers. And one of them is the CLSA, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, which I'm gonna tell you about. And the companion project, which actually is looking at neurodegeneration, um, the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging has a mul multiple teams, but we are in team 17. So there is research going on across Canada and, and we are the team who looks at the sensory cognitive connections. So a lot of the work I'm gonna present comes from the work of our team. And you know, I come from audiology and psychology. Natalie Phillips is a neuropsychologist. Paul Mick is an otolaryngologist. Walter Wittich is an optometry. So it's a multi-professional team, a multidisciplinary team, because we want to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and understand how all these pieces fit. So your government is working for you. I hope you're glad to pay your taxes so that we can do our research. Next slide. Let me tell you a little bit about how we started with the CLSA data. So it began um, a while ago, it began in 2012-ish, and the first wave of data was finished collecting, being collected in 2015. And the way it goes is at the beginning, people who were 45 to 85 years old 30,000 people living in 10 different towns or cities across Canada were enrolled. Some of you may have been enrolled. At the beginning, they had no cognitive impairment. They were quite healthy. 
And we measured uh, a team of hundreds of scientists, put this uh, protocol together, what would we measure? So lots of biological measures, social measures, cognitive measures, how you use the healthcare system, all kinds of data is there. So it's a real treasure trove. And we have been working with the first wave. Now we're starting to work with the second wave. So every three years, for 20 years, these 30,000 Canadians are providing data so we can understand the whole process of getting older and hopefully find some ways that people can live better longer. So I'm going to just give you a little snapshot of what we found when we looked at the hearing measure. Same kind of hearing test as you might have if you went to a clinic. And we're going to break it into mild loss and moderate loss. A vision test, just like you might have if you went to an optometrist. So where you look at letters and we find out how small the letters can be for you to see them. And also a balance test. And this kind of reminded me like what we were doing in the intermission because it was a measure of how long could you stand on one foot to measure your balance. So you all just gave yourself a test of that during the intermission. Next slide. All right, so I know that you're, you're not all scientists, but maybe some of you um, would like to see some graphs, but if you don't, just close your eyes and listen to me. Uh, so we have the auditory counts of people in that Canadian sample at different ages and how many of them, if you click on the slide, please, how many of them had a mild loss? How many had a moderate loss? So way more people have a mild loss, but there are still quite a lot of people with a moderate loss. And the older you get, the more to the right of the graph we go, the higher the lines go. The index, the axis on the right is the percentage who have a problem. So we could click a couple more times. So when do, you, do we have a situation where 50% of our older Canadians have a mild hearing loss. Well, that would be about when people get to be 75. And we're going to see if we carry on with uh, the vision data. So you can click away. We're going to have the same kind of graph, mild vision loss, moderate vision loss. More people just have a mild loss as they get older. And about 50% have a vision loss when they're, oh, gee whiz, around 75. So this is um, more than half, the majority start to have these issues in their mid seventies. Okay, next slide. Okay, yeah. So now, well, what about having both at the same time? And again, just to um, look at who would have both a mild vision loss and a mild hearing loss, well, now we have about half of those Canadians having both problems at the same time when we get to people in their mid 80s. And you're probably also thinking, hmm, well, that's starting to be when a lot of people begin to get dementia. So actually, you get your sensory loss, you get your hearing loss about 10 years before you get your cognitive loss. And the hearing loss that you have now will predict your likelihood of having a cognitive loss 10 years later. So this is kind of a, a gateway into what is the brain got to deal with when you're not getting the best possible input fed into the brain. Okay, next slide. All right, so now we add the balance. So now we've got hearing, vision, balance. Balance you need so that you can stand up and you don't fall over. Balance you need for walking. Balance you need for driving, actually, uh, as well. And here we have the number of people who have just one problem or two problems or three problems. And you can see that the lines go up as people get older. And having all three of these is something that many of us are starting to experience, um, that they start out as little problems and then they combine and some times you know we just have to um 
deal with a package because when we go out in everyday life, we have to hear, we have to see, we have to walk. And uh, all of these things have to work together. So it's kind of putting the whole thing together that affects us in everyday life. All right, next slide. So I would say, you know, I have studied hearing for the last 40 years and I feel that's very important, but actually around the world now, people are understanding how important sensory factors are for healthy aging. And why is that? Well, it's not just ears and eyes. It's because we need, we need to take in information so that we can live optimally, so that we can have fun, so that we can have a good quality of life, so that we can connect to others, so that we can talk, so that we can um, share experiences as uh, Myrna described in the first talk, so that we can uh, experience our environment. We know if the doorbell's ringing, we know if a bird is singing, or we know if there's a piece of art in the room uh, when we use our vision. And it's also important for monitoring ourselves. So we, we could not talk very easily if we could not hear ourselves. So actually being able to hear enables us to produce action with our mouth. Actually being able to hear and see enables us to you know, move our legs and walk without falling over or drive our car. So it's the connection uh, within our selves and to the world that senses allow us to do. So I'm a big fan of the importance of the senses to communication and participation. And I have to say, when I heard the first talk starting, I was thinking, oh, well, writing poetry and making art is something you do by yourself. But then what we all learned was that the joy of writing the poetry and reading it and sharing it and doing the art and talking about it, actually it was the communication, I would say, that was part of the magic of what we learned about in the first session today. So communication and participation. And sometimes we do that with language. You're all getting a lot of language exercise, listening to us uh, talk at you online here today. Uh, I'm not gonna sing any songs though, so don't get worried. All right, next slide. Let's, uh, let's just think about, you know, how do the senses and changes in our senses as we age actually connect to a very large number of health problems and also everyday activity, you know? So why does it matter? Next slide. Okay, so this is a Dutch study. Lots of people uh, across the uh, a large adult age range and almost 80% of them who said they had a hearing problem also reported at least one other chronic health condition compared to people with normal hearing. So this is something, you know, that actually begins early in life. And we would like to be able to make sure that you know, we are able to let people not fall into some of these other problems. So, so what kind of problems could they be? Next slide. So hearing loss is caused, you know, by some things that are chronic health problems. You know, if you have diabetes, you have a higher risk of a hearing loss uh, and certainly a vision loss. If you have cardiovascular disease or hypertension, you're also more likely to have these sensory problems. So there the health condition could be causing you to have greater risk of having a sensory loss, but it works the other way around too. So if you have a hearing loss, all of the people who study population health have found time and time again that hearing loss puts you at increased risk for cognitive decline and dementia. Hearing loss puts you at risk for more falls and injuries. Hearing loss puts you at more risk for social isolation and loneliness, for depression, for frailty, and even for death. So this is beginning to sound pretty serious. 
Um, but you can kind of see the chain reaction. So can we do anything about this? Let's keep going. Next slide. This is a very uh, famous paper that uh, you know made, made headlines in the New York Times back in 2013. It was done by some researchers at Johns Hopkins and it was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And it was looking at people who started out pretty much the same place at the beginning of the study. And then it looked at their scores on the tests that some of you might've had when you were being diagnosed for dementia or assessed for dementia. So the scores on that test, they go down over the years of the study, but they go down more for people in the hearing loss group than the normal group. So this is what I said that, you know, the hearing loss comes first, but then the decline into uh, dementia comes later and faster if you have a sensory loss. So this is a pretty, pretty startling finding. And people with hearing loss, you know, might have been pretty shocked to realize that they were at greater risk. Let's move on to the next slide. If in our study, using that Canadian longitudinal um, study of aging data that we had, we looked at many things. Executive function is, you know, how your brain does planning. And memory is another really important part of cognition that uh, is affected when you have dementia. Uh, we also looked at general health. So no matter what we looked at, we found the same kind of pattern. And that pattern was that, you know, the problems that you would have, say, in your general health, were significantly related if you only had hearing loss, only vision loss, or only a balance problem. But if you had two of them, so the orange bars, hearing and vision problems, hearing and balance problems, vision and balance problems, the, the problems that you have, your ratings of your general health get worse. And if you have all three of them, you know, you're really going to have a lot of problems. So these things travel in a pack. And, you know, once you have one, you're more likely to have the other one. And then, you know, things rapidly become a challenge for you. Next slide. So how can hearing loss, you know, you kind of would understand if you have a hearing loss, you don't hear your microwave beeping, you know, or you don't hear a small bird chirping. But actually hearing loss can affect how well your brain can work when you are doing things which might be needing your full attention. You know, if you have a bit of a walking problem, you need a full, your full attention to cross the road safely. And if you are also struggling to hear while you're struggling to walk, you know, these things can compound and put you at a big disadvantage. The same is true for driving. So, you know, it's not, it's not just about the, the beeping of your microwave. It's about how do you get on in, in the everyday world. Next slide. One of my colleagues in our sensory cognitive group in the CCNA, uh, Don Guthrie at Wilfrid Laurier, she looked at data from Ontario for all of the people over a number of years who had been in home care and long-term care. And she looked at how vision and hearing and cognition in combination and alone were related to how well people functioned, their communication difficulties. And, you know, the bottom line was that if you had some cognitive problems and you also had sensory problems, you know, that was, that was a, a much more serious situation. Now, maybe we can't change your cognitive uh, health once you have dementia, you know, but maybe we can change something about your hearing and your vision. Let's just have a look at a couple more slides for those of you who might like numbers. So we looked at out of almost 300,000 people in home care in Ontario in those years, and we found that one in five had this triple whammy of hearing, vision, and cognitive problems altogether. So that's a lot of people who are dealing with this as a package, and how can we, how can we have a strategy 
for working on the pieces that we can do something about so that they don't have some of those other consequences to their functioning. Next slide. So this is over 100,000 people in long-term care and one out of three, so more of them, had this triple whammy. And uh, so I think you can see where, where we're going. I'm kind of, you know, trying to tell you about sensory loss, but it really, it really interacts and it really affects how you live with your dementia and um, what can we do about it. So next slide, we're going to kind of turn a corner here and talk about sex sensory exercise. Okay, so you heard a lot in the first talk about how art, you know, would enable you to be creative and use your brain and communicate. And this is a kind of mental exercise. Plus, it's fun. It's always good if it's fun. So you get your your uh, emotions also uh, working for you instead of against you. Instead of being depressed, you know, you can enjoy something. That's really important. So how could we do sensory exercise for the brain? And would that make any difference? Let's go to the next slide. All right. So one of the things, one of the things that is kind of widely known, and I think it's a simple idea, you probably heard of the use it or lose it idea. Uh, another way of saying that is if you stay active, if you stay active, that helps to keep your brain healthy. Okay, staying active, staying active, staying active. That is a very good thing for your brain health. And those activities could be physical activities. It, they could be cognitive activities. They could be sensory activities. They could be social activities. They could be physical activities. Okay, so all of these kinds of activity give your brain a workout as well as your muscles, as well as uh, the other parts of your body and the other aspects of your health. And I like this definition of health that health is the capacity of people to adapt to, respond to, or control life's challenges and changes. So it's not that things aren't going to change. It's that how do you how do you come back and stay active? And I think a lot of people who are listening got some very good tips in the first talk. And this is a very important part of uh, getting on and living your life as well as you can, even if some of your abilities are changing. If we go to the next slide, uh, you know, how do you do that? Well, it really helps if you are doing activities in an environment that is easy. So it could be a physical environment. You know, it's a lot easier to hear if it's quiet than if it's too noisy. It's a lot easier to see if the light is good than if it's too dark. It could be the social environment because you go with your friends and you have a common activity in a group and people, you know, enjoy each other's company as opposed to, you know, not being able to do that. So we have to put together changes in our abilities with how do we get in a place, an environment where you know, we can still have fun and do things and stay active. Next slide. I thought I would just, you know, for those of you who are thinking about how do I keep my brain healthy so that I don't get dementia, you know, the D World Health Organization has come up with some uh, review of the evidence about what are the things that people have studied which might make a difference to reduce your risk of cognitive decline. And this is the list. And I will uh, draw your attention to the fact that the best evidence, if you want to do one thing that's going to be good for your brain health, it's probably physical activity. So that we have a pretty pretty good you know belief that that is effective. So you've probably heard about um, about this and the importance of walking, for example. 
Some of the other things you can do, you know, the evidence isn't as strong, but you know, what do you eat? Uh, do you have some cognitive training? Uh, do you manage your hypertension and your diabetes? And down at the bottom of the list are some ideas where we don't have sufficient evidence yet, but it looks like it's a good idea to stay socially active and manage your depression and manage your hearing loss. And we've had very important literature coming out in the last few years about what are the risk factors that we could modify that lead to dementia. And hearing loss has been identified as the greatest potentially modifiable risk factor for dementia. So now we're hot on the trail of how do we actually find out if we really can modify it and reduce people's risks. Let's go on to the next slide. So physical activity is great. Cognitive activity is great. Social activity is great. And to do any of those things, you need a good way of using your senses to engage in those activities. But we don't know so much about um, the benefits of that. If we go to the next slide, what we do know from some research, and this is again research done at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore by a researcher called Michelle Carlson. She um, has a treatment, an intervention, if you like these fancy words, but basically it's for the seniors to become volunteers in kindergarten. And they have to take a training to be the teacher's assistant and they have to commit to go so many hours a week and they have done this for years and there's very good evidence that this is good for the children and it's also great for the seniors it's good for their memory it's good for their walking it's good for changes in their brain it's good for their social connections Okay, so this is not something you have to go to a hospital for. It's not expensive. It's just what can you do in your community where you're going to be making music and talking and probably they were doing some art too and probably they were doing some writing and reading. So these are ordinary things and you just have to find what you like because you're never going to do anything if you don't enjoy it. So, you know, there are many, many choices that you have and don't underestimate the value that this could give you. Next slide. In fact, I mean, this is a, I don't know if you've ever seen this uh, kind of research, but this is research about your social relationships and your social connections, which was the story of Myrna in the first half of the talk, that if you have good social relationships, then you have um, a much better chance. Okay, so 50% increased survival, like you just live longer if you have stronger social relationships. So becoming socially isolated and withdrawing and becoming lonely, you know, that is, that is um, a slippery slope. So let's go to the next slide. These are the words of a woman with hearing loss who was about 80 years old. And she gave me this little note one day after a meeting of the Canadian Heart of Hearing Association. And she wrote, okay, so Myrna would like this. She was writing her, her story for me. When you are hard of hearing, you struggle to hear. When you struggle to hear, you get tired. When you get tired, you get frustrated, emotional. When you get frustrated, you get bored. Your brain starts to tune out. When you get bored, you quit. And then she said, but I didn't quit today. So we had a bit of discussion in the first half about perseverance. So, you know, if things get tough, you can quit or you can persist. And how do you find a way to persist that is going to work for you? Next slide. So this idea of what do we change in the environment is making places more hearing accessible. You know, everybody knows you'd have ramps for wheelchairs or you'd have elevators for wheelchairs, but how do we actually make the world easier uh, for you to 
use your hearing even if you start to have a hearing loss. That's something that we're interested in working on. Next slide. And so is the World Health Organization, and so is the Canadian government. So these initiatives called Age-Friendly Communities or Dementia-Friendly Canada, this is about changing the world so that it's not so hard to get out and do the things that you would enjoy doing, even if you have some cognitive loss, even if you have some sensory loss, even if you have some mobility loss. So we've got lots of ways we can improve those situations, lots of work to do. Next slide. All right, no, so you might have been afraid. I was gonna tell you that y'all had to go out and get a hearing aid. And I'll tell you, you know, there's a lot of people with hearing problems who don't have hearing aids. And there are reasons we're trying to understand so that the people who might benefit from hearing aids have better access to them. But some of these problems may or may not be solved by a hearing aid. So we have to look at these other kinds of solutions like improving the environments and uh, finding other ways of getting auditory information and getting auditory exercise. Next slide. Some of you may have seen some ads uh, that imply that getting a hearing loss is going to prevent you from getting dementia, and that is absolutely an exaggeration with no evidence, okay? So, you know, it's good to get a hearing aid if you need to hear things louder, and it's probably good for you to communicate. It probably is a good way to reconnect socially if that has been a problem for you, but, do not be fooled by some of the misleading advertising that you may encounter because there is no evidence that, you know, taking, putting a hearing aid on your ear is no better than taking a pill. Uh, it's not gonna prevent dementia and it's not gonna cure it. So having said that, what are our other options here? Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, first of all, you should probably have a hearing test. Um, I'm going to tell you that next week is World Hearing Day, and the World Health Organization is going to launch the first ever World Hearing Report, and they are going to recommend to all the member states that we have universal hearing screening in adults, because many people don't know they have a hearing loss, and they haven't done anything about it. So you should at least know, and you should at least understand what your options are, because the people who don't know they have a hearing loss still have a risk that is elevated for lower cognition and social isolation. And that is really what we want to prevent. We don't want you to have losses in cognition and losses in social isolation. Next slide. This is, you know, um, a little bit of a, one of the early studies we did with our Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging research, we looked at things measured in, in CLSA. How many people do you know in your social network? How many activities do you do when you participate socially? How many people are giving you support? You know, um, information, love, somebody you can talk to, that kind of social support. How many people think they're lonely? Next slide. And we found out that uh, people who have hearing loss, vision loss, or both, compared to people with normal sensory abilities, have poor social support and more loneliness. And the people with vision loss also had fewer friends that they interacted with and did fewer activities. So that's what we wanna change. That is what we wanna change. So now, next slide. What can you do about this? Um, have your hearing checked. Find out what your options are for technology. Find the places where you can go and you can function well. You know, the restaurants, well, we're not going to restaurants anymore. Uh, in, some, in some ways, Zoom is a little easier because you don't have to deal with crowd noise. Um, but, you know, where are the places where you can communicate? What theaters are the places, you know, where you can hear well? What kinds of lectures? Many people like to hear lectures on Zoom because it's easier for them to hear. 
So find your technologies if there's ones that could help you, your environments that there's ones that could help you. But also, what do you choose for your activities? And this is a book that came out recently. It was just published um, a couple of months ago. It's by Canadians, and it's all about music and the aging brain. And it has chapters in there about music and dementia, a lot of good information. And I just pulled out one little quote, um, which talks about learning a foreign language or bilingualism and music training being some of the sensory exercises with hearing that you could do that improves your brain health. And it is a good thing for you if you've done that since you were a child, learned a second language or been a bilingual since you were a kid or learned music and played in an orchestra or sung since you were a kid because your brain has become stronger because of that early exercise. It's also good if you have kept it up, but it's never too late to learn. So just like physical exercise, you know, if you're looking for something to do, and a lot of people have done this during COVID, you know, they've picked up a musical instrument and they continue to uh, work online with other people. And that is excellent, excellent exercise for your brain. Next slide. So you're probably thinking, well, so what is so magical about music? You know, everybody, Every country has a language, you know, there's French and Russian and English, different languages, but everybody has a language and every culture has music. And everybody um, does not become a musician, but there's, it's actually something that a lot of people um, do do, even if they're not a professional. And it's something people enjoy, even if they're not a professional. So why is it good for your brain, apart from it you know, being entertaining and fun? So maybe you would like to go to that activity. Um, well, in order to do language or music, the auditory system operates in time. I was kind of interested what Myrna um, was saying about uh, it's not, it's not the, um, or maybe it was Susan or both of them, that it's not the just the product of art, it's the process. And, you know, there is no product if you play a musical instrument, you play a song. There is no product, you know, when you're talking in a conversation, unless you happen to record it, and then you can replay it. But it's kind of a little bit different because it's in the moment. Music and language are in the moment. And timing is really important. So what happens when people are musicians is their brain develops very precise timing and synchronization. And it allows all the parts of the brain to work together in a, in a much smoother, more efficient um, way. So it kind of clears the cobwebs out of the brain to be doing music um, and that is uh, very interesting it's the synchronization across brain areas and the connections between the talking part and the listening part or the playing the piano and hearing it part it's the connections and it's creating you know the uh, motor you know how do you play the keys on the piano how do you read the music? How do you listen with your ears? It's making all those connections work together like a really well-oiled machine. Plus it's fun. So it does have positive effects on memory and attention and how fast you can do thinking. It also is great for synchronizing behavior with others. So if you are singing together, you know, you have to work together, you have to collaborate and if you do it uh, for any length of time, you, you can also start to share feelings that way. And you can share moods and some of the other things that were discussed in the first talk. And I think all of us have known people with dementia who even after they get past the point where they can communicate by language, 
uh, may be able to sing. My mother at the end of her dementia, she, she really wasn't talking, but my goodness, she could sing every verse of some of the Second World War songs that she had learned when she was a younger person. So it stays a long time in the brain and it's a way of harnessing some of those old memories and creating new connections. Uh, next slide. So um, we had a little bit of exercise uh, in the intermission. Uh, I uh, hope you give some thought to exercising your senses and music and singing and playing an instrument are all great ways to do that. So that's a fun thing you can do and it's good for your brain and good for your mood and uh, good for your social relationships. Next slide. Okay, so this is my message to you. Stay active, stay active. And you might have some hearing and vision loss, but it doesn't mean you can't stay active. And staying active and exercising uh, your auditory system is a, is a great way to exercise your brain. And then last slide. Uh, and I did say that next week is World Hearing Day, and that's a really uh, kind of big day. So keep your eye out for that in the headlines. And uh, hopefully we'll make uh, a world where everybody has some ways of dealing with their hearing loss and from uh, keeping their hearing healthy. And uh, we'll look forward to some great new things coming forward as we connect some of these WHO worldwide hearing initiatives to initiatives connected to the UN Decade of Healthy Aging, which has also started this year. So hearing and aging are gonna uh, be worked on together from here henceforward. All right, thank you very much.